This lesson will begin with a discussion of the anatomy and physiology of the human brain. Now to continue with the theme of understanding the brain, we're going to turn our attention and focus to those neurotransmitters and their impact on brain function. As coaches working with clients, we are often guiding a program to help them meet goals related to their health and wellness. Based on this need, we will dive into some basic principles about the anatomy and physiology of the brain, starting with the cerebral cortex. The lobes of the cerebral cortex serve many different functions within our brain. With the total volume of brain being approximately 1,500 cubic centimeters, the size of the cerebral cortex is an impressive 75% of this total volume. The surface of the cerebral hemispheres contains a layer of gray matter on the outside of the brain composed of gyri. The deep grooves with the sulci that create a cortical thickness of 2.2 meters in the cerebral cortex is involved in regulating sensation, voluntary movement, self-awareness, and communication. The cerebral cortex is divided into four primary lobes, the frontal, temporal, parietal, and occipital lobe. The main function of the frontal lobe is linear thinking, and another name for the frontal lobe is the prefrontal cortex. Both names have an indicator of its location in the brain. Scientists believe that the seat of consciousness is located in the frontal lobe, and it is believed to be involved in personality, emotions, intelligence, attention and concentration, judgment, body movements, and lastly, problem solving. Individuals who have problems with focus and attention, such as attention deficit disorder or ADD, often will have decreased functioning in their frontal lobe. The frontal lobes are considered our emotional control center of sorts and home to our personality. There is no other part of our brain where lesions can cause such a wide variety of symptoms. The frontal lobes are extremely vulnerable to injury due to their location at the front of the skull. MRI studies have shown that the frontal area is the most common region of injury following mild to moderate traumatic brain injuries. The temporal lobe is located at the temple and behind the ear. It is involved in hearing, memory, sequencing, and organization. This lobe allows us to have an understanding of the languages we use for communication. Those with mood and memory issues often have impaired functioning in the temporal lobes. The parietal lobe is located close to the top and back portion of the brain and is involved in the sense of touch and perceptions both spatial and visual. It also allows us to distinguish size, shapes, and colors. Using images of the brain, we can see deficits in parietal lobe function among patients with Alzheimer's disease. Since the parietal lobe is vital for sensory perception and integration, it also includes the management of taste, hearing, sight, touch, and smell. It's home to the brain's primary sensory area, a region where the brain interprets input from other areas of the body. Research has suggested that the more sensory input a region of the body provides, the more surface area of the parietal lobe is dedicated to that area. For example, the fingers and hands are a primary site for sensory data, so much of the parietal lobe is dedicated to receiving and processing that type of input. The occipital lobe is located in the back part of the brain. It is primarily involved in vision. Even visualization emanates from the occipital lobe. During times of visualization, the occipital lobe is highly activated. Now the cells of our brains are comprised of both neurons and glia, sometimes also pronounced glia. Neurons are the nerve cells in the brain and we are born with what we get for life. So what we have will stay with us for life. And most of them, or a majority, cannot divide, making each one really valuable because they should be viewed as irreplaceable. In addition to the inability to divide, we also lose some from exposure in our environment. And this is chronic exposure to things like heavy metals, pesticides, or herbicides in our food, and toxic chemicals in our environment. So even the air that we breathe 
One of the main ways that we interact with our environment will deplete some of our neurons. Furthermore, the neurons in our brain are highly metabolic and they require a really steady stream of glucose. Now ideally, this would come from whole foods like vegetables and fruit. The glial cells are support cells, yet they do not have a neural impulse. Instead, this support is more like building blocks that give insulation and support for the neurons that they surround. Glial cells comprise nearly half of the total mass of our brain. So while we know that the human brain has 85 to 100 billion neurons, it also has 10 to 50 times that in terms of glia. Myelin is a lipid, and it serves to both protect and insulate the actions of axons in the brain. Myelin will increase the speed of neural impulse conduction, reaching an impressive 200 miles per hour. You have probably heard of the disease or condition known as multiple sclerosis, or MS. And MS is considered a rare condition caused by the loss of this protective myelin sheath around the neurons. This loss significantly impairs neuronal communications, and in fact, it is the neuronal communication that impacts our behaviors. Later, we'll learn more about the ways that neurons are wired in our brain and how they direct our thoughts, actions, and even behaviors. As a coach looking to help a client through behavior change, this is useful to know because it's through the rewiring of this neuronal communication that we can achieve our goals. But neurons don't work in isolation. They communicate with other neurons, muscles, and glands at junctions known as synapses, which is a space between two cells where chemical messengers, called neurotransmitters, are released. And this has a really powerful impact on how we both think and feel. Neurons are really powerful and they have the potential to create anywhere from 10,000 to 40,000 synaptic connections. This alone illustrates the tremendous capacity and complexity of the central nervous system that we rely on for our very life. Neurotransmitters are the naturally occurring chemicals inside the body that transmit messages between cells and as such they control nearly every function of the body and are really important in regulating mood, memory, our ability to learn, and our overall brain function. There are actually hundreds of different neurotransmitters within the brain. However, some neurotransmitters are more well known and these are the ones that are most often referenced in the literature that you may have read and therefore you're probably most likely familiar with some of the terms that we're going to be discussing next. The list we will focus on are the four main neurotransmitters dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and gamma aminobutyryl acid or GABA. These neurotransmitters are directly involved in our ability to focus, concentrate, activate pleasure centers, and regulate our mood while giving us energy, enhancing mental alertness, and even relaxing our body. Obviously, a coach can see the importance of knowing these neurotransmitters. It is also interesting to note here that most mental illnesses or cognitive dysfunctions involve abnormal synaptic activity of one or more of these brain neurotransmitters that we have listed here. The human brain is essentially a chemical factory producing serotonin, dopamine, and other vital neurotransmitters for life to be what it is as we know it. It then becomes really important to consume raw nutrients at appropriate concentrations in order to generate these chemicals that are needed and used. Additionally, combinations of amino acids, vitamins, minerals, and other biochemicals from foods providing these raw materials must be an appropriate balance to synthesize the neurotransmitters that we rely on for homeostasis or balance within. Current research supports a belief that a low level of any of our brain neurotransmitters is now reaching an epidemic status. Now remember, neurotransmitters are obtained from amino acids, vitamins, and minerals that are consumed within our diet. And when deficient, neurotransmitter production can become negatively impacted. Caffeine and other stimulants 
can greatly reduce the effectiveness of neurotransmitters. A stressful work environment or a lifestyle of overstimulation can also impact your neurotransmitter levels, depleting reserves. The largest source of neurotransmitter production is surprisingly, however, in the gut. An instance of gut dysbiosis or dysregulation can also lead to low levels of neurotransmitters, while other factors including chemical sensitivities, allergies, blood sugar dysregulation, hormonal changes, and dehydration can also impact neurotransmitter levels. This is why it's important to understand that some of the most important neurotransmitters when deficient are associated with changes in mood and behavior. The first Low dopamine levels are associated with a childhood disorder known as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in which the individual has difficulty with focus and attention. Low dopamine is also a factor in addictive behaviors where the individual will use substances to release dopamine and stimulate the pleasure centers of the brain. Individuals who procrastinate with work, for example, or schoolwork, or other tasks are often low in dopamine and they use procrastination as a method to stimulate dopamine release in the brain. Low dopamine has been associated with a low libido and low motivation. Dopamine is also low in individuals with Parkinson's disease, a movement disorder resulting in the loss of neurons that produce dopamine in the brain. Individuals with low dopamine generally will have low energy, a low desire to do anything, and they often struggle to get motivated to do things like exercise, and they may have difficulty focusing or concentrating on things, so they often will gravitate toward drinking coffee or get stimulated from energy drinks, which mimic the effects of dopamine. However, these habits or this practice over time will simply deplete the body's ability to make its own dopamine. The precursor to dopamine is the essential amino acid phenylalanine, which can be obtained from the diet. Phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine, which is the amino acid precursor to dopamine. And this demonstrates how important proper diet is to providing the raw materials, in this case, an amino acid, to generate enough dopamine to support focus and energy. Norepinephrine is an excitatory neurotransmitter, which is considered a stimulating and energy-giving neurotransmitter, and it's associated with arousal, vigilance, and concentration. Norepinephrine is elevated during the stress response and it can impact the proper functioning of circadian rhythms and, when elevated, can result in restlessness and anxiety. Like dopamine, the precursor to norepinephrine is the amino acid phenylalanine, which gets converted to tyrosine, which is essential in the regulation of mood and metabolism. In the nervous system, Low levels of norepinephrine can result in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, depression, and obsessive behaviors. Serotonin is a monoamine neurotransmitter that's involved in the regulation of mood. It's associated with well-being and happiness and is instrumental in modulating appetite as well as the regulation of our sleep cycle. Low levels of serotonin have been linked with many mood disorders and illnesses including depression, obsessive disorders, chronic pain such as muscle aches, fibromyalgia or jaw pain, migraines, insomnia, as well as sleep disorders and even negative self-talk. Low serotonin is associated with carbohydrate cravings which, for some people, can lead to anorexia or bulimia. Serotonin is often considered the feel-good neurotransmitter. When levels of serotonin are low, we often see people gravitating toward foods that will support its production within the body. And this can come from healthy, nutrient-dense carbohydrate sources, including sweet potatoes, avocados, plums, bananas, tomatoes, walnuts, and pineapples. However, most people will go toward the non-nutrient option of carbohydrate sources that include cakes, cookies, pies, grains, and dairy. So what makes serotonin levels dip down or go low? There are believed to be many causes, one being a tryptophan deficient diet, stress, and high cortisol levels can actually increase the activity of an enzyme that breaks down serotonin. 
Excess inflammation in the body can stimulate enzymes that break down tryptophan, a precursor to serotonin. The body also might just not make enough serotonin. People who have blood sugar imbalances or insulin resistance have issues with serotonin. Vitamin B6 deficiency, which is important in converting tryptophan to serotonin, can result in low levels of serotonin. Magnesium deficiency can also prevent the body from making adequate levels of serotonin. The last neurotransmitter to discuss is GABA, or gamma-aminobutyric acid. This amino acid acts as a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system and is believed to facilitate those instances when we want to decompress or go into a relaxed state of mind. GABA is essential to brain metabolism and is important when we consider that there are times each day we want to calm our brain down. Consider when the adrenal glands release excess stress hormones such as cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. GABA will then work to decrease neuronal activity and inhibit neurons from overfiring. GABA is also known to prevent anxiety and stress-related messages that reach the motor centers within the brain. This is believed to be accomplished by occupying the receptor sites that would allow excitability to occur. So GABA would serve to calm the body much like tranquilizers but without being addictive. Deficiencies in GABA can result in both emotional, psychological, and physical symptoms including anxiety, panic attacks, and sleep concerns such as insomnia, restlessness, or even seizures. If you have a client who reports feeling stressed or frequently overwhelmed, you may want to recommend supplementation of GABA. Since we have brought up the topic of these neurotransmitters and GABA, specifically and to a lesser extent serotonin, it's now a good point to transition into a discussion about supplementation and the role of the brain fitness coach. Now, obviously, we don't diagnose or treat, and we certainly don't prescribe anything like a doctor would. And even the suggestion or recommendation of a supplement has to be done very carefully by the coach. So with GABA in particular, we need to look at how it will impact our client, and if it's even appropriate to recommend as a supplement. So let's say that your client feels the physical constraints of an uptight physical state, and you think that they might benefit from using GABA for this type of symptom. Now, taking GABA is generally considered safe, and some experts even see it as a good supplementation that's advisable if your client consumes excess sugar, alcohol, or drugs like marijuana to help their body systems relax. The amino acid taurine is the precursor to GABA and can be taken to help GABA supplementation calm the brain down in addition. This is where things begin to get a little interesting, however, because as a neurotransmitter in the brain, GABA and all of the other transmitters in the brain that we've talked about have a really specific function. Oftentimes, we hear of supplementation concerns related to teaching the body not to make it as it naturally occurs if we supplement it into our daily intake. Consider melatonin, for example. Some researchers and medical professionals believe that if you take melatonin regularly, you can teach the body to stop making adequate levels of melatonin. The body perceives that you have plenty due to the supplementation, so in theory, it slows down or stops production. But there are other concerns. GABA has not been shown to cross the blood-brain barrier. However, newer research shows, one, that it has not been tested on humans, and two, that we, like all supplements, need more testing before we can make a suggestion or say anything definitively about its use as a supplement. So it's important to be critical and think of all angles when you're talking to a client about supplementation. This will wrap up our training on neurotransmitters, but there is a separate chapter and reading dedicated to this topic. Any of this information can appear on your exam.